Alejandro sat at the bar, in a corner, sipping his beer. It was hot outside, and two or three glasses wouldn't hurt him. Today's workday had barely begun, and there was no work. The personnel department came running with notices that the company was about to be downsized. There was something tricky about it, but it was costly to argue with the bosses. Alejandro believed that the owner of the enterprise something wised up with their salaries and long ago decided that it was time to leave. Especially since there was a place to go. He is a qualified builder, owning all the specialties. In the midst of all this fuss about downseizing, he wrote an application, which the personnel officer dictated to him. He wrote that, in connection with the notice of impending redundancy, he gave his consent to the early termination of his employment contract. With the simultaneous payment of additional compensation in accordance with the labor code, the personnel officer paid special attention to the dates. As a result, Friday was technically his last working day. Tomorrow is Friday, his last day of work. But he didn't have to go to work because he had been given his work record book today. In the meantime, Alejandro pondered how to tell his wife. Things had been bad at home for a long time. His daughter had married, lived separately, and often called her parents. His son was studying at university and was rarely in town. In the summer, he went somewhere to earn money with a student group. His wife worked as deputy chief accountant of a solid enterprise. She never admitted that her husband was a simple laborer, and she never showed him to anyone. Although in conversation, Alejandro could shove any engineer under his belt. Yes, and the money that he earned was quite weighty. In addition, he also worked part-time outside of working hours. He did all kinds of repairs in apartments. With his wife, who considered herself an intellectual, their relationship began to cool down. With each passing year, they became more and more distant from each other. And when the children left their parents' nest, they began to live like neighbors in a communal apartment. They even slept in separate rooms. No, Alejandro raised the issue of marital duty, to which Beatrice replied that she owed nothing to anyone. Only his money on paydays was regularly withdrawn by her. Alejandro tried to find ways to reconcile with his wife, but she considered him a loser who could not even finish university. Although at one time, Alejandro left his studies to support his family and give him the opportunity to finish his studies. And he left from his final year. As a result, he had an incomplete higher education. And in the meantime, he took care of his daughter and helped his wife to finish university. But still, in his wife's opinion, he was a loser. He finished his beer and went home without hurrying. Beatrice was not there yet. For the last three months, she had been working late. But Alejandro realized that Beatrice was seeing someone. He tried to talk to her, but she avoided talking to him. Around 9 p.m., the door slammed. Beatrice came home. She went into the kitchen, turned on the kettle. She called Alejandro. He came in and she told him, On Saturday, our company is going out for kebabs at our recreation center. What does this have to do with me? Or you're letting me know that you'll be away for two days and you'll be with your lover at a barbecue. What are you talking about? What lover? You know best. I don't need to be informed. I'm informing you because you're coming with me. At the recreation center, we'll have our own room. The bosses require all employees to have their soulmates. You got it. And be advised, your refusal will not be accepted. Alejandro thought that Beatrice was planning to reconcile with him, so she invited him to the barbecue. Maybe his conclusions about her cheating are wrong. He decided to take her up on her offer and said, I'll be ready on Saturday. What time are we leaving and what's the vehicle? We are being driven in our two buses. We leave at 7 a.m. from our office, so we leave the house at 6.10. In the morning, Beatrice went to work. Alejandro never told her that he had quit. He decided to devote the day to putting things in order. Beatrice had long demanded that the tools be removed from the house. So he did it. He brought the car and took all the tools out. He cleaned it up the garish. And so the whole day went by. In the evening, Beatrice came home late. 
she said she'd gone shopping and brought a snack, even though the director had promised a buffet. On Saturday, Beatrice entered the room in which Alejandro was sleeping, five minutes before his alarm clock rang, and said, Come on, get up, we gotta get ready. Since everything had been ready since the evening, they got ready quickly. For the first time in the last three months, Alejandro and Beatriz had breakfast together. They took a small minimum of clothes with them. Knowing that they would have a separate room took a dark tracksuit. I also took an excellent camera with a powerful lens, having previously cleared the memory card. After breakfast, having quickly cleared everything from the table, they moved out to the shuttle bus. The morning was wonderful. After listening to the weather forecast for the weekend, Alejandro firmly rejected the idea that he should bring an umbrella. What Beatriz was taking with her, Alejandro did not look at because his opinion was not accepted in this case. He was only acting as a load carrier. Beatriz carried only one constant attribute, a woman's purse. We arrived at the assembly point, loaded into the buses that came up. Beatriz introduced Alejandro to some of her colleagues. She introduced him to Julio's boss and his wife, Vera. When Beatriz introduced them, Julio looked at him with a kind of studying, guilty look. And looking at the tenderness with which Beatriz was talking to Julio, Alejandro put together the puzzle that he had been trying to solve all these days. Unnoticed, Alejandro took a few pictures of Julio and Beatriz talking away from everyone else. This did not escape the attention of Julio's wife, Vera, on the bus, Beatrice and Alejandro's seats were next to Julio's and Vera's. So all the way there, Beatrice turned slightly toward Julio and talked with him, discussing some project that involved both the accounting department and the department where Julio worked. Vera listened attentively, but did not join the conversation. Alejandro was also silent, looking out the window, where the forest flashed by, replaced by fields. At the seating, Alejandro noted that there was some inequality here as well. The leaders closest to the director sat in the front. The director himself went to the barbecue in his company car. Ordinary workers of the enterprise took the back part of the bus. They drove for about an hour along the highway, then turned to a country road and drove to the recreation center. And then they drove through the gates. The general director was already there. He gathered everyone and proposed. My friends, our recreation center has been idle for a long time. By the efforts of our economic department, the territory has been put in relative order. We are settling into two buildings. At the entrance to the main building hangs a list of who and where will be placed. The third building has been partially renovated. It's not being moved in yet. After that, I propose to gather on the sports ground at the outdoor pool. Our organizers have prepared an entertainment program for us. Alejandro and Beatrice checked into a relatively nice room on the second floor overlooking the recreation center. The room had two separate beds, a table, and two chairs. There was a built-in closet and a shower. Beatrice quickly put her things on the shelves and ordered her forward to the pool. I'll say, you're behaving yourself. You keep quiet, you don't show your hillbilly culture. All these years, my culture has suited you. What happened now? You should act like Julio. He's nice to talk to. All right, let's go. Alejandro took the camera and followed his wife. As they passed the dining room, Alejandro noticed that they had brought more than six cases of vodka alone. There were also five cases of fortified wine. For himself, he noted that the party was going to be a real party. Moreover, each couple, not knowing the scope of the party, brought alcohol with them. Before lunch, everyone was entertained by the organizers from among their employees. I must say that all their games and contests went well. All this time, Alejandro watched his wife, not noticing that he himself is the object of close attention from Vera. In the course of the contests, it happened that Alejandro and Vera, who acted as players, were next to each other. Vera suddenly asked, Tell me, Alejandro, do you know they're having an affair too? Who do they have? Julio and Beatriz. No, but that's what I realized today. And what do you think you're going to do about it? I don't know yet, but I'd like to see proof of their affair. 
I have them. I could share them with you, but I don't carry them with me. What kind of evidence is this? These are pictures of their lovemaking sessions, mostly in the evenings after work. I'll tell you, they're pretty explicit. But why do you need them? If for divorce, then in court you can indicate not similarity of characters, different views on life, lack of common interests. In addition, you can divorce and through the civil registry office, let's say, in the administrative order. The main thing is the absence of common children and the joint submission of the application. In the registry office, the motive for the termination of the marriage, in principle, is not found out and no one is not interested. No, this is about the children. They're adults, and I'll almost certainly be blamed for breaking up the family. And Beatrice, she's the injured party. She can twist things very cleverly. I'll get a divorce in court, and I'll plead adultery as the cause of divorce. But then please don't mention in court the source of your evidence of infidelity. Also, I want to warn you, you're about to be introduced to a young man named Danny. He's in my husband's department. His job, as Julio instructed, is to get you drunk at dinner tonight. Keep that in mind. Getting me drunk to get rid of me? How do they plan to get rid of you? I'll get rid of them myself. I'll tell my husband that I don't feel well and that I'll take a sleeping pill, and then I'll go to bed. And at nine o'clock at night, my brother will come by car and wait for me at the gate. He's taking my things out of the apartment with a friend. Just so you know, the road to the left of the gate leads to the station. It's not far away. I just don't know the train schedule. And further on, you have to go through the woods. Two kilometers, there's a big village. Are you leaving the apartment to your husband? An apartment? We have one room. It used to be a small dormitory. Now it's a breeding ground for alcoholics. I'm moving into my brother's apartment. He got married, and he doesn't live in his apartment, and he doesn't rent it to anyone. Three rooms in the center are empty. What about your brother? He lives in the suburbs. He has a cottage there. A wife with a cottage? No, he built it himself before he was married. If you're thinking of leaving tonight, I can give you a ride into town. Thanks for the offer, but I'll take the train. Just leave me your phone number so I can get the photos from you, in case I need them. Toward evening, the braziers were fired up, and excellent kebabs were served for dinner. Beer kegs were brought out, and vodka appeared on the tables. And yes, Alejandro was introduced to Danny. Danny immediately took a seat next to him, and while Beatriz and Julio danced, he poured. While Vera was sitting at the table, Alejandro didn't drink a single shot, although Danny, who was already drunk, thought he had poured almost half a liter of vodka into him. Alejandro, pretending to be very intoxicated, began to fall asleep, which pleased Beatriz very much. She ordered, Julio, Danny, take my alcoholic to his room. Danny enthusiastically started dragging Alejandro, helped by Julio, who had been drinking. They dragged Alejandro to bed, accompanied by Vera, who said she had taken a sleeping pill, arguing that she had a headache and needed to lie down because she had gotten up too early. As soon as everyone left and the door closed, Alejandro got up and went out onto the balcony, went down to the balcony a floor below where he jumped to the ground and lurked in the bushes. He had a perfect view of the entire lighted hall where the dance was taking place. There was no one outside. Vera came out of the enclosure through the emergency exit and walked to the gate. As she passed, Alejandro said, Good luck. Alejandro, have you left the room yet? What's there to go down on the balcony? Okay, good luck with that. I was informed that mine took the key to room 14, in the building no one lives in. It's on the first floor. The windows face that way. Thank you. Alejandro moved quickly to the opposite side of the enclosure. Soon a light came on in one of the rooms, feeling like a scout, Alejandro silently climbed to the first floor balcony and peered through the window. Through the gaps in the curtains was visible Beatriz, who was kissing Julio. The window was open. Alejandro placed his cell phone on the frame, in which he turned on the recorder. He himself, at the same time, took pictures through a gap in the curtains with his camera of what was going on in the room. After half an hour, he got bored with it all and noticed that the lovers were not showing any activity. 
he realized that they had simply fallen asleep after drinking quite a lot. Quietly pushing the balcony door, he entered the room, collected all the clothes of the lovers, and left the room through the door, which was also unlocked. Thinking about how to thank the lovers, Alejandro walked to his building, where there was a sculptural composition, and decorated it with elements of clothing, having previously wet the knots and thoroughly tightened them. Here on the bench, Alejandro found a sleeping Danny, who had gotten drunk himself trying to get Alejandro drunk. For all that, Danny was sleeping with his shoes off. His fancy shoes were standing near the bench. Alejandro decided he needed to thank Danny as well, so he sent his shoes into the fountain. The fountain wasn't working though, but there was water in it. After that, Alejandro left the grounds and was at the station in half an hour. The station had a small-sized waiting room. There were two people in the lounge, a woman in her thirties and a drunken man. Alejandro looked at the timetable and saw that the next train was at 6 a.m. The night would be spent in the waiting room. At that time, a scandal broke out between the man and the woman. Alejandro realized they weren't a couple. It was just a bored, drunken man who started hitting on the woman. Alejandro was fed up with it, so he approached the drunkard, lifted him by the pecs from the bench, and sharply put him back down. He exclaimed, Man, what are you doing? I was just kidding. I'm not, and I'm in a bad mood. You're not going to be here with me till morning. No, I've got a train. I took the ticket. I wanted to meet a girl. What train? To the city? No, from the city. I have to go the other way. There you go. The man got up and quickly left for the platform. Girl, you're on that train too. Thank you. You're like a rabbit. I'm just meeting the train. A friend's coming in from out of town for a visit. I'm stuck. The next train isn't until 6 hour a.m. No, 6 mer a.m. That's on weekdays. Tomorrow is Sunday. The first train won't be until 9 o'clock. At this time, the girl's cell phone rang, and she answered it. Luisa, I'm listening. Are you on your way up? What do you mean you're not? She disconnected the phone and said sadly, A friend isn't coming. She's late, and now I have to walk three kilometers through the woods alone. Where do you live? There's a village down the road. I'll rent you a corner to sleep in, and you can take me home through the woods. I'm afraid to go alone. I see I have no choice. You can spend the night. If it's convenient for you, I won't say no to an overnight stay. They left the station building and walked along the road. After a while, they entered the forest. It was really kind of uncomfortable there. Alejandro started a conversation. Let me introduce myself, by the way. My name is Alejandro. What's your name? My name is Diane. Here's a flashlight. I brought two, one for a friend. Lighting their way, they moved along the night forest road. Isn't there any other way? There is, but it's a detour of seven kilometers, and here, directly, only two. There's a river next to the village, wooden bridges. It won't hold a car. And we can't build a normal bridge. They say the banks are swampy. How did you get here? Alejandro thought for a moment and told what had happened to him. Diana said, I don't understand your wife. She just hasn't seen any real country boys. They're getting fewer and fewer. Now in our village, there's internet in every house. I lived in the city too. No, I didn't get married there. I went to school, and then my mom got sick. She was the only one left in my village. I had a good job in the city, but I lived in a rented apartment. I gave up everything, came to my mom, and now I've been here for ten years. During that time, I became the head of the kindergarten. Now the only problem is heating. The local cooperative really helps. How could they not? The kindergarten is theirs and the children of their employees. They bought pipes and radiators, but they can't install them. No specialists. Besides, they have summer, the busiest work during mowing, reaping, and harvesting. And every summer day feeds the winter. You know, Diane, let's go to your daycare tomorrow and take a look. I know a little bit about this. 
As they talked, they reached the bridges, crossed the road, and found themselves in the village. The streets were dark, but Diana led Alejandro confidently up the wooden steps to her house. Finally, she opened the gate and they stood in front of her house. The house looked imposing in the dark. They walked inside. Diana suggested, you want to have dinner? Thanks, I think I'll go to bed. Can you show me where? What about going to daycare? Diane, everything still stands. Diana made Alejandro's bed. He went to bed. He did not fall asleep immediately. He reasoned how lucky he was today, several times. And Vera gave out a lot of information, and with his wife decided. It was clear that he was not going to live with Beatrice, but he had nowhere to live, except in the garage where he kept his tools. Beatrice woke up first. She was lying on the bed, Julio snoring deafeningly beside her. She pushed him. The snoring stopped. Julio, come on, get up. We gotta get back to our room. I think we fell asleep in here. I'm getting up. My head is killing me. Why didn't you turn off the light? You said it would be more erotic. Where are my clothes? You threw it on the floor. They got up, started looking for clothes, and made sure they were gone. Beatrice, realizing that the clothes were gone, did not hesitate to wrap herself in a sheet and went out. Julio followed her, doing the same. It was dawning outside. As they approached their enclosure, they saw Danny snoring on a bench. Nearby, on a sculptural group, they saw their clothes. All attempts to remove them failed, as the clothes were tied to the sculptures and the knots were wet. The only success they had was finding Beatrice's room key in her clothes. Beatrice grabbed it and fled into the enclosure, and Julio unleashed his anger on Danny, whom he began beating with his fists. A distraught Danny jumped up and began to cover his face from the beating, screaming, Julio, why? I did everything you said. Why did you tie my clothes to the statues? I didn't knit anyone. I fell asleep on the bench. And my shoes are gone. How could they not? They're swimming in the fountain. Beatrice, at that time, slipped into her room, found the clothes she had prepared for the second day. Having looked around the room before, she realized that her husband was not here. At the noise outside, staff members began peering out of their rooms. Someone identified the clothes hanging on the statues as belonging to Beatrice and Julio. There was quiet laughter. From the third floor, from the balcony of the suite, the general manager was watching the whole thing. Julio realized that he had become a laughingstock and fled into the building. He asked the night clerk for a spare key to his room. He went in and found his wife gone. He related in his mind what had happened and realized that Danny had been caught in the act for nothing. He wondered if Alejandro would know where Beatrice had been at night. He was a big man. But the door opened and a dressed Beatrice came into the room and asked, No wife either. As you can see, I don't understand. Alejandro had a bottle of vodka poured into him last night. How could he go anywhere, and where would he go out here at night? There's a station nearby. It has yet to be reached. You were the one who carried him into the room from the dining room. Yet his things are gone. Why are you wearing wet swim trunks and no clothes? It's the only thing I took from the monument. I didn't bring any spare clothes. I'm gonna go see if the monument will give me my pants. I have a feeling my wife and your husband made us at those barbecues, and we're in for a rough time. I'm not giving him a divorce. Do you think he'll ask? Or is there already a law requiring him to live with you? Julio, he loves me. If I wag my finger at him, he'll be at my feet, just like you. You're such a fool. I wouldn't be at your feet even if Vera kicked me out. You were my entertainment. I was gonna give you to Danny. That's why he was giving your husband a drink, only he passed out. I believed you were sincere. I thought if it weren't for our families, we'd have a future. Yeah, right. Only you left your husband to bunk with me, not to love me. We never existed. It was all about animal pleasure. I have to say, as a woman, you were a complete failure. And it was your choice, not mine. My choice is my wife, and you're no match for her. A furious Beatrice slapped Julio in the face. 
As a result, it was a decent manly fist punch, which made Julio fall down. Beatrice then left the room. Leaving the room, Beatrice began to realize what a foolish thing she had done to her marriage. After all, she loved Alejandro in her own way. But the children had grown up, there were fewer worries. She had more free time. And she wanted to feel wanted and loved. She took Alejandro's love for granted. And then her eyes fell on Julio. He was younger than her. He said beautiful compliments. Beatrice made some inquiries about him. It turned out he was a party animal. His assessment of her as a woman today shocked Beatrice. She wondered how he could evaluate her when today was only their third meeting. And that, due to excessive drinking, she wasn't sure they'd had anything at all. Walked to her room, sat on the bed, and started calling her husband's cell phone. But, as she expected, he didn't answer. The operator said stubbornly. The subscriber's device is turned off or out of range. When Beatrice was convinced of the futility of her attempts, she threw the phone down. She decided not to call her daughter yet. She had to think up her own version of what had happened. And she had to come up with something sensible for the meeting with her son. In fact, it was urgent to get out of this space, but the bus wouldn't leave until the evening. Laughter could be heard outside. Beatrice went to the balcony and saw that many employees, having woken up, went to their balconies and watched Julio trying to untie the knots to take his shirt and pants. He paid no attention to Beatrice's holiday clothes hanging there as well. Everyone had gathered for breakfast. In the dining room, there was only talk of the night's incident. As soon as Julio appeared there, everyone stopped talking. It was only there that many people saw a decent black eye. Danny came into the dining room with a bruise on his face. Barely recovered from last night's drunkenness, he poured a beer and drank it in small sips, enjoying it leisurely. Reasoning, he realized that it was the beer that had ruined him yesterday. He did not know that when he had taken his eyes off the table, Alejandro had poured a glass of vodka into his beer glass, then pretended to drink the vodka himself. It was this rattling cocktail that proved to be Danny's undoing. Even more silence was caused by the appearance of Beatrice in the dining room. But she, in spite of her headache, looked quite well, for she had taken time to apply her makeup. She, in complete silence, went to the keg with beer, poured a large mug, and defiantly sat down at a table separate from Julio. Vodka and wine began to be brought to the tables, urging them to finish everything so. They wouldn't have to bring it back with them. In the morning feast continued, and discussion of the incident. At the same time, the version that Beatrice's husband caught her in adultery and beat Julio and Danny, after which, together with Julio's wife, left the recreation center. Alejandro woke up around nine o'clock, remembered where he was, quickly dressed, made his bed, and went out into the hallway. There were some sounds coming from the kitchen, indicating that someone was there. He went into the kitchen. Diana was setting the table. When she saw him, she said, Good morning, it's good that you're awake. Let's have breakfast and go to kindergarten. Good morning, is daycare open today? It's Sunday. Today people are working in the fields, so the kindergarten is working. In fact, they wanted to make it round the clock, but they changed their mind. So you're working today? No. I was waiting for a friend, so I took the day off. After breakfast, Diana and Alejandro went to the kindergarten. It wasn't far, on a paved road. Alejandro asked, What were we doing on the wooden gangways last night? We came from the other side, and there is no asphalt there. It ends 30 meters from my house. There was not enough money. But they built a good kindergarten. They say that the chairman of the administration built this house for himself. But it was taken up by the main department for combating economic crimes and it turned out that the administration built the kindergarten. After a while, Diana said, Well, here we are. Alejandro evaluated the kindergarten building and noted that it needed some cosmetic repairs. But overall, the building looked good. The territory itself was clean. In the courtyard, small children swarmed around a low slide. A teacher looking after the children came up to them and reported, Diane, I have 14 kids in my group today and the neighboring group has 10. 
That's fine. This is a heating specialist. He'll assess what needs to be done to repair it. If you have any questions, I'm in the groups or in my office. Determining what the repairs required took a long time. Alejandro scrutinized the blueprints Diana had given him, walked through the nursery with them, and finally came up with his summary. The blueprints don't match what was actually done. Most likely there were problems with the heating. I'm surprised it was warm at all. I don't know. It was all before my time. And there was no one to show me the drawings, much less compare them with what had been done. The daycare center will have to be closed for a week while the heating is repaired, and I need helpers. I'll get staff to help. I'll get involved myself. So it's going to be women who carry the batteries? What can we do? We unloaded them ourselves. Well done. The weight of one section of batteries I've seen weighs 7 kilos. The sections are assembled in 7 pieces. That's 7 times 7, so that's 49 kilograms. In order to preserve the health of workers established maximum permissible norms of single lifting weights, but no more than 50 kilograms, and women no more than 15 kilograms. I understand your enthusiasm, but everyone should do their own thing. Let me go to the chairman. Is it far? Let's go together. The office is two doors down. Oh, great. I'll take the drawings. We'll have to redo this diagram. You can see that it was designed for a coal-fired boiler, but you have a gas boiler. I'll go to the chairman myself. What's his name? Paolo. Alejandro went outside and walked in the direction indicated. He found the office and went in. There seemed to be no people, so he followed the sign and found himself in the reception area. He went through the reception room to the chairman's office. A man of his age was sitting there. Uh, hello. Well, hello there. Who do you want? I'd like the chairman, Paolo Henrique. Paolo, are you there? Alejandro, it really is a small world. So you're the head writer here? How did you even get to the village? I got there by distribution. The district needed engineers for construction, so I was assigned, even though I wanted to go to the city. And I graduated from the institute, and here I am no longer a civil engineer, but the chairman of the board. Hey, how about some cognac? No, thank you. It's okay. It's business. I guess you're right. It would be embarrassing in front of the workers, because I have a dry law for the harvesting season, and suddenly I'll be drunk. Tell me what you want. Alejandro told Paolo why he had come, and what had happened to him. How he had met Diana, how he had volunteered to help her. Paolo thought about it and said, Alejandro, we'll make a contract with me. It has to be official. You'll get the radiators and pipes on the delivery notes. I have them in my warehouse, by the way. In addition, you need an estimate for these works. Understand, I'm not a bureaucrat, but when the inspection comes, they'll take my pants off. Well, get your men ready. I understand your demands, and they're fair. We'll do it by the book. I'll go to the city, and I'll bring everything I need, and I'll make an estimate. But basically, we're going to need a project. Why? Replacement of engineering networks is not done one-to-one. -one. There will be changes in the scheme, diameters, material of pipelines. You need a project, and you will have to pay for it. Don't worry, they won't charge much. Just tell me, can I act on behalf of the settlement? Why don't you let me hire you? So you're going to send me out into the fields to pick spikelets for the men? No, I'll take you on as a heating engineer. Okay, here's the deal. I'll come back in a week with a project. So soon? Your kindergarten is a standard kindergarten, which means that such projects already exist. Give me the forms for letters so that I can apply for the production of design and estimate documentation. Here you go. I'm going into town in an hour to the executive committee. I can give you a ride. I'll be there in an hour. Alejandro returned to the daycare center. Diana waited for him, asked, You got a deal? Yes, it's solved. But it's not that simple. The estimate you have isn't enough. You need a project. But it's manageable. You'll give me the corner. What do you mean? I'm employed in the administration, but I have no place to live. What are you going to do? Repair the heating of the kindergarten. They discussed the subject of repairs some more. 
and Alejandro said, I'm going into town right now, so I'm picking up all the paperwork. I won't be back till next Friday. Would you mind if I put my car in your yard? I have an empty garage there too. That's fine. I'll bring my tools. I'm afraid to leave them in town. Alejandro returned to the settlement board. Paolo was already waiting for him. He got into the car and they drove into town. Paolo asked, Where are you going to live? Uh, the head of the daycare center. Diane. I approve. She's a good woman. Her house is in good repair, even though it's been empty for a long time. Her parents are dead. Her brother died in a car accident saving lives. Her father was a model worker. He could do everything. He built his house like a Tarek. The whole village went to admire his house. And he had a great bathhouse. They don't make them like that nowadays. How do you know? It's my job to know everything about everybody. Where do you want me to drop you off in town? I'm thinking the garage district. I'll check on the car. And you're going to spend the night there? I've got everything set up in there, even canned goods. I've got tools to pack up and load into the car. Have you talked to your wife? No, I didn't turn my cell phone on either. They're probably just leaving the campground now. It was. Beatrice to the quiet laughter of her co-workers. Most of them were already drunk. Julio got on the bus. His clothes had dried but were badly wrinkled. Danny, with black eyes, was helped onto the bus. He couldn't hold onto the seat and fell into the icely. They decided not to touch him, to let him sleep it off until the city. Beatrice wondered what she would do to her husband for embarrassing her at the company barbecue. The drive took a long time, but finally, they arrived. She quickly grabbed her things, said goodbye to everyone, and staggered to the shuttle bus. Twenty minutes later, she was standing at the door of her apartment. At first, she rang the bell, but no one opened the door. Then she took out her keys, opened the door, and found herself in the apartment. She wanted to hurl profanities at her husband, but suddenly realized he wasn't home. Everything was still in its place. Her husband hadn't come home. She went into the kitchen, sat down at the table, and wondered what her mistake had been. She'd originally thought Alejandro was an underachiever. And now he was getting back at her for everything. No, she hadn't cheated on him before. She hadn't considered the affair with Julio to be cheating. It was just that one day, she wanted to try to look at her life outside of her family. She wanted to have some freedom from her husband. She wanted to feel loved and desired by someone other than her husband. She already knew that he loved her and would do anything for her that she asked. That said, she had no intention of leaving him. There were too many reasons why she couldn't do that. She planned to grow old with her husband, to raise her grandchildren with him. In her plans, it was just a little flirtation for a few months. And that's when Julio came along. He was well-read, could speak beautifully, and most importantly, intelligent and courteous. But as the incident at the barbecue showed, he was a real asshole. He wanted to offer it to his employee, Danny. That said, they'd only had two full-fledged meetings before that day. She didn't like Julio as a man, but she hoped he would improve in the future. At the recreation center, he and she just got drunk and blacked out. In general, shame in front of the entire staff, although shame is not smoke, does not eat eyes. We'll have to be patient, all those years of having a career, and suddenly she can't do it anymore. And anyway, wherever she goes to work, those kebabs will haunt her for a long time. But she'll get her revenge on Julio. But first, she'll get her dumbass husband back. Sashka. He did it all out of emotion, but he's not going anywhere. The only thing I don't understand is why he didn't show up at home. The fact that he didn't take his clothes is a clear sign that he'll be back soon and she decided to go to his work tomorrow and make him come home. Alejandro was sitting in the garage. He had planned tomorrow and was now sitting at his desk, waiting for his phone to charge. The table wasn't empty. Since he had planned to spend a week in the city, he had gone to the mall and bought groceries that didn't need to be cooked. Tonight, he had a wonderful dinner and indifferent to alcohol. Alejandro bought himself a couple bottles of cognac. 
he decided to celebrate the beginning of a new life in this way. About restoring his relationship with Beatriz, he did not even think about it. Apparently, for him, it was really from love to hate one step, and it was made. Alejandro took a small piece of cheesy and carefully placed it near the hole in the wall he had discovered. The phone charged. He picked it up, looked at it. There were a bunch of texts from his wife. Lots of unanswered calls. Plus, calls not just from Beatrice, but from unknown numbers. Apparently, the wife was trying to call from other phones. A few calls from the daughter decided to call her back. Lisa, hi. I see you called. My phone was dead. I just got it back on. Hey, Dad. I was just calling to see if you're picking up any part-time work. What do you need? Our faucet is dripping. My husband says we should write a complaint to the Housing and Repair Association. Can he handle the malfunction himself? He did it. Wrapped a rag around the faucet so the water wouldn't drip loudly. Now it drips quietly. Are you staying home? Sure. Where would I go with a belly? I'm going to have a baby soon. Okay, I'll come by tomorrow morning and do it. Did your mom call? You know she never calls me. She thinks my husband's not of this world, that he doesn't think like everyone else. Dad, he's a computer programmer, and she thinks she has nothing to talk about with him or me. Okay, how are you feeling? Great, anything I want, Rojas buys it right away. He made the nursery beautiful. And you say he can't do anything? Dad, he hired a designer to draw up options for the nursery. The company came in and did the work. Rojas just paid the bill. Why didn't he do that with the faucet? So the sound of the drops can't be heard now. I see. Wait for me tomorrow. After his daughter's call, Alejandro called back an old comrade with whom he had once studied at the university. His interlocutor answered, Yes, I'm listening. Rodrigo, good evening. It's Alejandro. Oh my God, Alex. And it's so official. I hear you're doing well. You've become a director. And whose fault is that to you? With your skills, you'd be a minister by now. Alas, I gave everything to my family. My daughter is about to give birth to a grandson. My son is at our university. Well, where are you? I resigned from the firm where I worked for over 20 years. Finally, I've been telling you for a long time, drop them. So I quit, and I'm going to divorce my wife. What happened? Well, let's not talk on the phone. I'm home alone right now. My wife is staying at her mother's, and she won't be home until tomorrow. You know the address. I hope I don't have to remind you. I'm not far from here. I'm in the garage. Wait for me. Twenty minutes later, Alejandro entered Rodrigo's apartment. Immediately, he said, Rodrigo, I'm sorry, but besides memories, I have a favor to ask of you. Alejandro, I'll do everything I can for you. I need an approved project for a major overhaul of the heating of a kindergarten for a hundred seats. For rural areas, from a gas boiler? Yeah, that's the one. We have such a project, we'll do it for you. I'll help you get approval. But I'm not free, it's all paid for. So I brought the paperwork. Some eagles have already rewelded the heating there, so now everything has to be redone. And they sold them used pipes. They're as thick as paper. We gotta change everything. And who's going to do the work? Me and whoever Paolo gives to help. Is that our Paolo? Yeah, that's him. He's the chairman of the administration now. I'll help Paolo. He could have come to me himself. He can't. He's in the middle of harvest season. All right, come on into the kitchen. We'll sit down. Tell me what's going on with your wife. Alejandro sat down at the table. Rodrigo poured. They drank and a friendly conversation between two old friends began. Toward the end of the meeting, Rodrigo said, I warned you about Beatrice's arrogance. You thought she'd change, and because of that, you and I didn't see much of each other. She thought our whole class were losers. I remember that, but I was young then. All right. Hey, why do you need the administration? Come work for me. I'll hire you as a technician. Your education is more than enough. You read blueprints like an open book. Rodrigo, 
I promised Paolo and the head of the kindergarten. I see. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow you'll come to my place after lunch. Before lunch, go to the address I'll write you, find Ivan, and tell him for me. He will make you a major repair of heating, inexpensive, and on such an object in a week, and talk to him yourself. Stay at my place tonight. No, I have a place to sleep. You have to work in the morning, I can sleep in. So go to sleep, what's the problem? And your wife will be here in the morning. It's okay, I'll warn her. No, thanks. I'll see you tomorrow. Besides, to be honest, I've got plans in the morning. No matter how much Rodrigo persuaded Alejandro to stay, he said goodbye and left. He went to his garage. There, locking the doors, he checked for cheese at the entrance to the mink. The cheese was gone. Alejandro broke off another piece and put it in place of the one he had eaten. Then he settled down for the night. Beatrice woke up and, remembering the time limit, quickly got ready and was at Alejandro's work in 40 minutes. While waiting, she stopped at the bulletin board and learned that Alejandro had been fired. She made her way to Human Resources and asked, Good morning. Can you tell me when Alejandro was fired? He had his last day of work on Friday. Tell me, where did he go to work? We don't know that. Who are you, exactly? I'm his wife. You should ask your husband where he got the job, and we're in the middle of a downsizing. Although the director was very unhappy that he was fired, he cussed at those who made the downsizing list. So we can't help you. Beatrice left the office and ran to her work. She was on time. She went to her office, grabbed the prepared papers, and went to the chief accountant's office. She was on excellent terms with the chief accountant. The latter regarded her for her persistence and knowledge. When Beatrice entered her office, Milagros greeted her with a cheer. Hello, bummer. Hello, bummer. Have you been briefed yet? Come on, we've got a lot of excitement going on here. The director's laughing all the time remembering the picture of Julio reclaiming his clothes from the monument. He left your clothes behind for some reason. What did your husband say? Did he like the kebabs? He didn't tell me anything. I guess that's what he did. And left the house. I just think he's going to come back for his clothes. He quit his job, though. At that time, Julio walked into the office. Milagros... I'd like to sign a bypass. You're quitting? What am I supposed to do when I'm embarrassed like this? What about the wife? My wife packed up and moved out. A lover? No, I'm thinking my brother's apartment, but I'm not supposed to be there. She suggested we meet at the registry office tomorrow to file for divorce. What about tomorrow? It's the day off. Yeah, well, they work on Saturdays. Where are you going now? I don't know. Maybe I'll go back home to my parents. At this time, Alejandro was finishing loading his car with his belongings. He waited until Beatrice left for work in the morning, gathered his clothes, some of his belongings, and loaded them into the car. On the table in the kitchen was a note from Beatrice addressed to him. He did not read it, but put down his own note, in which he pointed out. Beatrice, I've got my things. If you forget something, it's not critical to me, throw it away. Don't look for me or call me. When I'm ready to talk, I'll call myself. Alejandro. Alejandro moved his stuff out, made two runs, put it all in the garage. After that, he drove to his daughter's house. Knowing what kind of faucet and sink they had, he stopped by the building store where he bought a filter, a flow-through multi-stage filter. He also had with him the necessary tools for installation. His daughter greeted him happily and offered him breakfast. She said at the same time, Dad, Mom always hated to cook. The way you cooked always tasted better. She's probably still making you cook now. Not anymore. I don't cook for her. Do you have a separate table or something? We have a separate desk and separate living arrangements. Now, let me get this straight. She had a bow at work, but I found out about it when she invited me to a weekend shish kebab party, a corporate event. They decided to get me drunk so that I wouldn't interfere with their lovemaking. So, what, you're drunk? 
No, of course not. But I can give you the audio I recorded on my phone. I also have some good quality video I shot on my camera. You want to see it? I'll listen to what's on my phone, and I won't watch what's on my camera. I think that's enough for me. You listen while I take care of the crane. Dad, it's just a gasket that needs to be replaced. Daughter, I've wanted to put in a nice modern faucet for you for a long time, but you've always told your husband that he'll do it himself. I have nothing against him, but he says, don't do it yourself, trust a specialist, and he doesn't have time to trust a specialist. And I'm a specialist, so I came on my own. My daughter sat in her room listening to conversations recorded on her phone. About 40 minutes later, he reported, Mistress, take the job. Lisa, who had listened to most of the conversation, returned his phone, went into the kitchen, and tested the faucet, and was satisfied. Only the second faucet for drinking water was surprising. A satisfied Alejandro explained, You can drink water from this faucet right away. The water passes through a purification system. Where's the system? I hid the system under the sink in the kitchen table. There is unused space there. That's right, you can't get in there. Now the system is there and purifies the water. The user manual is here on the table. Sit down at the table and while I set the table, tell me what you're going to do now. It's okay. I'll get a divorce. That's what you call doing nothing? Where do you live now? It's still in the garage, but it won't be for long. I quit my job. We're downsizing. I've already got a job elsewhere. I think the housing issue is being resolved there, too. And where is that? Lisa, when I get settled, I'll definitely invite you to visit. But right now, I'm not going to tell you anything. You think only of yourself and my grandson today. Eat, listen to quiet music, read books aloud to him. Oh, Dad, the only books we have at home are basic programming. I don't know, maybe he'll be interested, too. In general, buy folk tales and read them yourself so that your grandson can hear your voice. All right, it's a deal. Well, what are you going to do? Lisa, I'm a grown-up boy. After a short stay with his daughter, Alejandro went to the address given to him by Rodrigo and found Ivan there. They talked it over. Ivan's company did major repairs on heating systems and gas equipment. Quality work. Ivan knew Alejandro from rumors as a savvy specialist and immediately offered him, after finishing work in the kindergarten, to come to his work, the post of manufacturer of works. Alejandro replied, Ivan, I need to think about it, and I don't feel like going to town yet. In the afternoon, as promised, he went to Rodrigo's house. Rodrigo had called a small meeting. In general, being a great organizer, he could inspire people to do things. And at the end of the meeting, Alejandro was assured that on Friday before lunch, he would be presented with an agreed and approved project for the overhaul of the heating system of the kindergarten for a hundred children. Beatrice desperately searched all over the city for her husband. The possibility that he might be living in the garage had not occurred to her. Although she drove up there on Wednesday, there was a huge barn lock on the door. She didn't know that Alejandro, in their last year together, had made the entrance to the garage from the back. The gate, on the other hand, opened from inside the garage. The barn lock hanging on the door played no role. That door wouldn't open. Alejandro was out of town on Wednesday. He had moved some of his belongings to Diana's house that day. He had to meet with Paolo to clarify the issue of payment for the project and subsequently payment for the builders. First, he visited the Board of Administration, solving all the issues, then he stopped by the kindergarten, picked up Diana, and they drove home. There he unloaded the car. Diana took him a room on the first floor. In order not to delay the issue, Alejandro immediately stipulated with her the conditions of his stay. That day, he stayed overnight. At the same time, Beatriz, realizing that surely Alejandro would contact her daughter, decided to call her. Lisa answered quickly. Mom! I'm listening to you. Lisa, hi, tell me, do you know where your father is? That's right, Mom. You haven't called me in almost a month. You know I'm going to have a baby soon, but you don't care. Daughter, I started with the most important thing for me today. 
I didn't call before so I wouldn't bother you. I would have asked about your father and how you were feeling, but it's important that I find my father today. He disappeared without telling anyone. Mom, he told people where he was and what was going on, but only people who didn't stab him in the back. And yes, Dad hasn't told anyone his new address. He doesn't want anyone accidentally telling you where to find him. I don't know his address either. He was at my place after your barbecue trip, and he told me everything. What could he have told you? It's not like I had anything with Julio. Mom, I'm amazed you can lie so blatantly. Dad has an audio recording of your meeting on his phone, and I listened to it, and I was disgusted. Daughter, I don't know what kind of audio he has, but it wasn't cheating. He also has a video taken on his camera. From where? I believe he took it off himself, which leaves no doubt as to what happened. If you're going to keep lying to me, we'd better end this conversation. No, daughter. I'm not going to lie to you. Just tell me what daddy wants. Mom, he left you. Didn't you notice he took his things out of the house? I noticed that. He left me a note in which he promised to meet me and talk to me. That said, despite the shame I have suffered, I am willing to forgive him, and I will not give him a divorce. As far as I know, he didn't promise a meeting. He promised to call. I just don't know how soon it'll be. You've hurt him so badly. You've spent your whole life thinking he's a loser. I understand that, but you tell me. How do I get him back? What do you need him for? He's just starting his life. What about me? And you skipped out on him with, what's his name, Julio? You found your soulmate, so live with him. Your dad let you go. I don't want that bastard. He quit his job, and he said he was going to hand me over to another employee. Can you believe that? Like a baton. Mom, how old are you? Don't you realize that daddy was everything to you, and now you have nothing? Now, at your age, you have to look for someone who hasn't drunk. Normal men are already sorted out and living with normal wives. I'll tell you one thing. You lost your daddy. On Friday afternoon, Alejandro arrived in the village. He unloaded the second part of his tools and clothes. Diana was at work. After unloading, he gathered all the documents, put them in the car, and drove to the board. Paolo was there, dealing with some issues on the phone. Alejandro laid out the project in front of him and armed with a stamp to produce the work, stamped all the sheets, followed by a signature and date. Alejandro said, I gave the photocopy to the contractor. Sunday night they drop off. They start work on Monday. One question. Is there somewhere we can put a crew of eight? Here are the keys to the clubhouse. We don't use it anyway. There's beds and mattresses in the annex. There's enough for them. You can get some linens from the warehouse. Where do these beds come from? It's the students who came a long time ago. A construction crew. In the evening, Diana and Alejandro had dinner. Alejandro put cognac and champagne on the table. He said, Now we can have a housewarming party. What? You're not going into town anymore? Well, only if it's work. I go to work on Monday like everybody else. So that's Monday, but tomorrow, what are you going to do? I'll do some work on your house tomorrow, and I saw that you have a bathhouse. Yeah, the bathhouse is nice. Get up in the morning, pump water, and heat it up. In the evening, it will be hot enough for a steam bath. Don't you sweat it? Me too, and I'll get a friend. Is she married? Almost. She's coming here with her fiancé. So the girls go first, then the boys. Then I'll run for a beer first thing in the morning. I think four liters will do. Why so much? Her fiancé doesn't drink. So you need to add a little steam. Of course we should, but we don't have any liquor in the store. Prohibition during the harvest season. In the morning, Alejandro started the car and drove into town. He wanted to get four liters of beer, but his eyes stopped on a five-liter keg of Heineken. When he got back, he pumped water into the tank and heated the stove in the bathhouse. Closer to eleven, the gate slammed. A pretty girl and a man entered the yard. The girl greeted Diana cheerfully and introduced her companion. And this is my Danny. It's a pleasure. 
Alejandro, meet Danny. This is Danny and my friend Luisa. Alejandro said hello to Danny without giving the appearance that he already knew him. Danny did the same. They walked into the house. Diana seated the guests at the table and said to Luisa, Tonight, you are my guests. I won't let you go until tomorrow. The sauna will be ready now. Luisa and I are going to steam before it gets too hot. That's fine. While you're steaming, I'll prepare the meat for the barbecue. Hopefully, Danny will help me. Now I suggest we have a few beers and a bite to eat. We brought beer and some wine, too. Danny doesn't drink. A little alcohol wouldn't hurt him. Right, Danny? They sat down at the table. Alejandro poured beer for everyone, saying, Wine after a sauna with kebabs. There's cognac for the boys. After another hour, the girls went to the bathhouse. Alejandro and Danny were left alone. Danny, turning to Alejandro, said, Look, I'm sorry about the whole barbecue thing. Only Julio, he was my boss, and I couldn't say no to him. And then he told me Beatriz had her eye on me, that I should get you drunk and put you to bed. So I fell for it. I found out later he'd been bullshitting me. Come on, forget it. You better tell me, is it serious with Luisa too? Didn't we tell you? We applied to the registry office. When the registry office manager saw me with bruises, she asked me, Young man, what have you got there? And Luisa said it's nothing, he didn't want to go to the registry office. So what? We just laughed. How'd you get the bruises? Don't you know that? I got you drunk, I drank too much myself. I fell asleep on a bench by the fountain. And in the morning, Beatriz and Julio, wrapped in a sheet, went to the building and saw my clothes tied on the sculptures, and next to me, sleeping on the bench. They decided it was my pranks, and Julio laid a thoroughly good one on me. What did you, Louise, say? Where did the beatings come from? She was working, so she couldn't come with me. I told her we had a tournament, and I lost it. I hope you won't talk about our meeting. Let's just say Beatriz isn't talking to me and Julio quit. And by all means, I'll keep my mouth shut, but don't tell me how you screwed me over at the barbecue. Speaking of kebabs, I marinated the meat yesterday, so there won't be much fuss. There's a grill in the yard. It's not far from the bathhouse. We'll flood it when we go to the bathhouse and make coals. While we're steaming, we'll put wood on it a couple times. As soon as we come out, we'll put the kebabs on skewers. Tell me, with Beatrice, what happens next? Divorce based on infidelity. And living with a woman is also infidelity, isn't it? Not really. I'm in Diana's corner, and we sleep in separate rooms. I can't deny I like her, though, and I think we might have a future together. Diana is a beautiful woman, but Louisa is better. You know, Danny, as one poet said, there's no arguing about taste. There's a thousand opinions. I've experienced this law firsthand. I mean, even Einstein, the physics genius, had a very relative understanding. I heard that somewhere. The women came out of the bathhouse, wrapped in robes, towels wrapped around their heads. They walked solemnly past Alejandroa and Danny and disappeared into the house. As they went, Diana said, in about five minutes, you can go to the bathhouse. Alejandro fluted the brazier, the flames quickly engulfing the dry wood, and called out to Danny. Let's go steam. Time flew by. Alejandro and Diana grew closer, and more and more often in the evenings, their dinner conversations lengthened. The repair of the kindergarten's heating was finished, the heating system was checked, and at the same time the water supply was tested for leaks by means of pressure boosting. To carry out the pressurization works, they used pressurization pumps. And one evening, when Diana and Alejandro were having dinner, suddenly Lisa called and said, Dad, don't worry, I'm like having a baby. You shouldn't be calling me, you should be calling the ER. No, it's okay, I'm already in the hospital. Did you warn your husband? Of course, he brought me to the hospital. The nurse says he's sitting in the flower bed under the window. Lisa, don't worry. I know it's hard, but you'll get through it. How do you know? When your mom gave birth to you, I sat under the windows of the maternity house, too. 
Speaking of mom, she called me after all, pretty much as you suspected. She tried to blame everything on you. I'm glad you had the strength to leave her. Dad, she doesn't love you, and I'm totally on your side. Dad, I love you. I think it's time to have the baby, Diana said. We'll have to get her a care package. The apples are good and the pears are ripe. The berries are mostly gone, but there are gooseberries, blueberries, and cranberries. Raspberries are in the woods and at the end of my vegetable garden. Are you suggesting we take a flashlight and go berry picking at night? Tomorrow's a day off. Let's go to the woods in the morning. We'll pick some mushrooms, and in the afternoon, we'll go to our daughter's maternity hospital. They did. Diana woke Alejandro in the dark. He started the car, and they drove into the forest. It was dawn by the time they got there. The spot Diana pointed out was a huge raspberry patch, she said. Before, only big companies used to come here because bears were afraid of them. What about now? No bears. Gone. After the paved road, they went a hundred kilometers away. They're overreacting. Civilization will catch up with them anyway. In the taiga, they even go out to the highway and beg. They spent a long time picking raspberries, echoing each other. But finally, Diana did not answer Alejandro's call again. He walked in the direction where she was supposed to be and saw her sitting quietly under a bush. Diana noticed him and gestured for him to be quiet. Looking where she pointed, Alejandro saw two healthy bears. They were outwardly, peacefully picking raspberries. Taking Diana by the hand, Alejandro quietly lifted her up and they walked off in the direction of the abandoned car, trying to step noiselessly. When they saw that they had enough raspberries and mushrooms, they decided not to push their luck and drove off. Diana noticed. Oh my gosh, I thought it was the bears coming back. Back home, they had a quick snack, gathered groceries, fruit, put on a liter jar of wild raspberries, and drove to the maternity hospital. By this time, Alejandro knew that Lisa had given birth to a boy and that she was doing well. In the afternoon, drove up to the maternity hospital. Diana stayed downstairs, and Alejandro went to the ward. Diana got out of the car and was standing next to her when Beatrice came up to her and asked Ed, Who the hell are you? E. Diana. What happened? No, it's nothing. I'm Alejandro's wife. I saw that you came with him. Tell me, are you and him serious? Yeah, he and I are serious. How long have you lived here? We don't live here yet. Although you could say we are living under the same roof. How long ago? No, I met him the night he left your company barbecue. It must have been fate. And your husband? What does he tell you? I wasn't married. Then it's fate. I'll tell you what. Take care of him. I know neither he nor my daughter will forgive me for my stupidity. Tell him to call me and we'll work out the divorce. Good luck! Beatrice turned and walked away. She had already given her daughter the gear and had been talking to her on the phone since morning. At that time, Alejandro came up. He saw his wife leaving. He asked, Diane, did she hurt you? No, she told me to keep you safe and not to give you to anyone. I'm sorry. I should have known we'd run into her. Nothing to apologize for. Although, to be honest, meeting bears in the raspberry patch had been much more pleasant. Alejandro called Beatrice back, and they had a meeting at the town cafe. Ironically, the highlight of the program there was kebabs. Beatrice asked to be forgiven and excused herself, saying, You know, honestly, I don't even know why I did it. I knew Julio was nothing. Nothing. It was only when I came home and I didn't see you that I realized I'd lost everything good in my life. I'm not going to fight the divorce. I've already fallen in my daughter's eyes and my stubbornness will cause me to lose her, and you're not coming back, and I wouldn't forgive myself for that. In the end, Alejandro and Beatriz divorced through the civil registry. Neither he nor she made any property claims against each other. The civil registry office was not interested in the reason for the divorce. Alejandro continued to live with Diana under the same roof, and one day after the divorce, 
he proposed to Diana. They filed an application. Beatrice continued to live alone. She tried dating, but the suitors didn't suit her. Some needed money, others were drinkers, others were married and interested in one-time, short-lived encounters. Vera, Julio's wife, also found happiness. Her brother organized a small picnic with kebabs in the yard of his cottage. The older brother of his wife was invited to the picnic. He was single. After they met, they dated for about a year, and then he proposed to her and she accepted. Julio, Vera's ex-husband after the divorce, managed to get a job as an engineer at a small private enterprise with a small salary. The owner of the company had inquired about him at his old place of work and warned him that he would not tolerate any shenanigans in the team. Eventually, Julio met a woman who shared a small apartment with him. She was divorced. They began dating and then living together, without registering their marriage. 